Bones nestled down inside it and promptly fell asleep. At the last moment, Molly, the foolish, pretty white mare who drew Mr. Jones's trap, came mincing daintily in, chewing at a lump of sugar. She took a place near the front and began flirting her white mane, hoping to draw attention to the red ribbons it was plaited with. Last of all came the cat, who looked around, as usual, for the warmest place, and finally squeezed herself in between Boxer and Clover. There she purred contentedly throughout Major's speech, without listening to a word of what he was saying. All the animals were now present, except Moses, the tame raven, who slept on a perch behind the back door. When Major saw that they had all made themselves comfortable and were waiting attentively, he cleared his throat and began. <clears throat> Comrades, you have heard already about the strange dream that I had last night. But I will come to the dream later. I have something else to say first. I do not think, comrades, that I shall be with you for many months longer. And before I die, I feel it my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. I have had a long life. I have had much time for thought as I lay alone in my stall. And I think I may say that I understand the nature of life on this earth as well as any animal now living. It is about this that I wish to speak to you. Now, comrades, what is the nature of this life on Earth? Let's face it, our lives are miserable, laborious, and short. We are born, we are given just so much food as will keep the breath in our bodies, and those of us who are capable of it are forced to work to the last atom of our strength. And the very instant that our usefulness has come to an end, we are slaughtered with hideous cruelty. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he is a year old. No animal in England is free. The life of an animal is misery and slavery. That is the plain truth. But is this simply part of the order of nature? Is it because this land of ours is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life to those who dwell upon it? No, a thousand times no. The soil of England is fertile, its climate is good, it is capable of affording food in abundance to an enormously greater number of animals than now inhabit it. This single farm of ours would support a dozen horses, twenty cows, hundreds of sheep, and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. Why then do we continue in this miserable condition? Because nearly the whole of the produce of our labor is stolen from us by human beings. There, comrades, is the answer to all our problems. It is summed up in a single word. Man. Man is the only real enemy we have. Remove man from the sea. And the cause of hunger and overwork is abolished forever. Man is the only creature that consumes without
so today is January 6, 2021. It is the one year anniversary of, well, pretty much the one year anniversary of my channel. So <laughs> I just thought I would share with you um, some content from Audible. This is an excerpt of George Orwell's Animal Farm, read by Patrick Tull, T-U-L-L. -L. George Orwell, O-R-W-E-L-L. -L. It's, <clears throat> I guess, an allegory, a political allegory, the first political book I ever read in school. I'm not sure if it's on the reading list in school anymore, but... It was back in my day. I can't remember who was a grade seven, but uh, just in case you missed it, it's worth worth listening to. You don't have to read it; you can just listen to it. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's short. It's not really directly applicable to the insurrection. It's more about the perversion of the ideals of uh, members of a revolution, revolutionary uh, fighters, I guess you would say. Um, by a few, not by all, just by a few, the leaders really. <laughs> so I don't know if that's necessarily applicable to January 6th or any kind of January 6th discussion. Uh, but uh, certainly when we look at uh, a situation where, uh, you know, no one has disputed that the, who the commander in chief is, it's a pretty direct line. The military is formed in such a way so that there is no confusion in times of um, emergency attacks or whatever. You don't want a question what the chain of command is. You know what it is. So uh, that's really not up for dispute. And yet, even so, <laughs> we're still having commissions uh, discuss this. So, you know, there you go. It's could only be uh, a language education barrier, perhaps. <laughs> a failure to connect the dots, where really there are no dots to connect. It's, um, it's a direct line. Okay, well, <laughs> that was my first political book, and um, I guess it served me well. Thank you, YouTube.